<laughs> My name is Sylvie Leotin, and I'm a former ballerina, computer scientist, and tech entrepreneur. Through my background, I experienced that technology innovation and artistic creativity are two sides of the same coin. Unfortunately, those two worlds are disconnected. Technology innovators are in their own bubble, while artistics, artists are keeping to their circle. I think this is lessening our collective innovation potential. After all, Steel Job has shown us the magic that can flourish at this powerful intersection. I'm starting Task Lab to bridge the creativity silos and stimulate cross pollinations between artists, scientists, and entrepreneurs to spark creativity and innovation. All my life, I've had a dialogue inside my head between the dancer, the artist, and the scientist in me. And I thought about bringing this dialogue to stage for public discussion. So here we are today, gathered, to talk about artistry, creativity, and innovation. Thank you all for being here. My hope tonight is to start a conversation that I hope will continue online, offline, and at future events. We invite you to visit our website at castlab.net. And for those of you tonight who are going to tweet during the event, you can use the hashtag CASLAB, C-A-S-T-L-A-B-S. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our great panelists. I will start with Indre. Indre Viscontas is a professional opera singer and neuroscientist. <coughs> he has a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA a BS from the University of Toronto, and also a master's in music from San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Indre has sung leading opera and chamber music roles and was recently selected to audition for our own San Francisco opera. Congratulations, Indre. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. You don't know, but she was actually supposed to audition tonight, and she was kind enough to change the date so she can be with us. We really appreciate it. Wow. And wasn't she fabulous? Yes. 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 Michael Keelan, on my left, is an accomplished entrepreneur, filmmaker, author, and painter. He has founded and ran a successful analyst firm called Killen and Associates. He has published six books on math and computing and 400 TV programs on creativity and innovation. Michael is also a talented painter who leverages his art to drive awareness and change for climate change. He's the author of the largest sustainability painting, which is going to debut in January at NASA's new sustainability base. We're very excited to have you tonight. And Howard, whom most of you know, but for the CAS Labs members that are new to SVII, is the founder and CEO of SVII. Howard was a former executive with Bose and Apple and a senior technology advisor with DARPA. He is a physicist and an electrical engineer and an active jazz musician, performer, and composer. Thank you, Hope. So, now we're going to be starting the debate. To get an idea, I wanted to find out who... Uh, you raise your hand if you would qualify yourself as an artist. How about scientists? How about neither artists nor scientists? <laughs> How about who thinks of him or herself as creative? Wonderful! <laughs> okay, so I have lots of questions and um, I'm going to 
throw some ideas uh, for the panel to take, but I would also like the audience to participate. So I will be asking questions to the audience as well and also leave you some time to ask questions at the end. So we have some very talented uh, panelists and I was curious um, to find out a little bit about their background. So I would like to know, first from Indre, if you sh can share with us how you became an opera singer and if you were an opera singer before you were a neuroscientist or afterwards, how did that happen? Okay. Um, so it's my, it started out very early in my life. My mom's a conductor. She conducts choirs. And so from the time I was you know, five, she decided it was a good idea to put me in front of an audition panel. Um, and I really bombed that audition. Uh, but I learned very quickly that uh, you, know, you have to really work at something to make it worthwhile and to get better. So I continued to train my voice. Um, and uh, I, I went, so by the time I finished high school, um, I was singing, you know, as much as I could, uh, but I'd always kept my worlds, academic worlds and singing worlds separate. And I came from a family of immigrants and the idea of doing a music degree was just, no, that's not what you do. You're either a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, something with a few letters behind your name. Oh, no, it's <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, the way I, I went and did a bachelor's in science, and after I finished that degree and had a few letters behind my name, I decided I'm going to go be a singer. So I moved to London, and um, just because I wanted to, and decided that's the good place to be a starving artist. Um, it's not a great place to be a starving artist. I quickly learned, you know, working at the Royal Opera House six nights a week as an usher and, you know, various other jobs. Um, and then at the same time, I, I had gotten an offer to do a PhD in neuroscience at UCLA, where they were going to offer me um, quite a bit of money at the time for me. It was an amazing amount of money to be a student. And uh, so I decided that that would be a great five year project, and that after I got my PhD, it would open lots of doors and I could do all kinds of things, um, which was a naive thing to think, but um, somehow I stuck to that dream and finished my PhD at UCLA. And then I got the music degree, and, and that's sort of how it happened. Oh, okay. Do we have a second microphone, maybe? Oh, great, you read my mind. Is there a good place to be a starving artist? <laughs> San Francisco is not a bad place to be a starving artist. Yeah. London's just really expensive, and, uh, you know, it's easier in the States. New York's not such a good place to be a starving artist, either. No. <laughs> For the same reason. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to ask the next question to Michael. Michael, um, I would like you to share with us how you became a painter. I think it's a very interesting story, so. Good evening. Let's see it. I never had any desire to be a painter. And not too long ago, I could not even put Picasso and Matisse in perspective. And I never really got around to going to college but at an extremely young age, I wound up being the head of a trading department of a computer company, the head of the publishing department of a computer company, a sales manager of the state of Florida, the head of a software development department, and the special assistant of a president of a computer company. And I was, I always had PhDs working for me, and we, and I was always asked or I discovered important things that needed to be analyzed for the chairman. And then after six years of that, and, and really I had about six or seven jobs in this one company, I started my own firm helping all sorts of corporations around the world think deeply and discover new ways and new opportunities business opportunities around the world. And so I really, except for those six years, I never worked for anybody. And I was having a wonderful time running this think tank and getting to travel all around the world as much as I wanted to and to explore any kind of topic that interests me and that I felt we could make money. But then, in, I think it was 1996, I had an injury to my knee. And I went and had a full knee replacement, and I had pain before I went in for the operation, but when I came out, I really had pain. And 
it never went away, and it got worse and worse and worse. And it broke my heart at the time because I lost my ability to see patents and to run my company. And I had to shut down my company and with the prospect of having, you know, never to work again. And this was, you know, I don't know, 14 years ago or so. And so I started just doing little different things because I couldn't work and I was having a lot of operations, always preparing for an operation and, and always recovering one for one. And we have a friend of the family who ran an art critique. And every month, artists would come in and show their work. So I used to go to those events and just sit there. And I was studying artists and how they think. And but I wasn't painting. I had no desire to paint. And then one day, the head of the creek critique said to me, Michael, would you come to my studio on Saturday? I would like to get you started painting. And I said, Leonard. Gee, that's really nice of you, but I have no interest. A month later, he asked again, and a month later he asked again. I, finally, I started to feel sorry for the man. I went over to his studio, and he put two canvases in front of me, and he said, Michael, okay, paint. You know, here's, just stick your hand, and if you want to, here's some water, here's different colors, here's brushes, you know, do what you want. I said, Leonard, there's absolutely nothing I want to paint. And he said, Good, Michael. I'll tell you what, I'm going for a walk. Why don't you just reach into that can of red paint and smear it around and then the yellow, or whatever you want to do, and I'll be back. An amazing thing happened. I reached into the paint and I smeared it around and I saw things. And then immediately the canvas and the paint started to speak to me. And I changed a few things, more colors, and I did the second one. He came back in a half an hour and I thought, he was just putting up me on. He said, Michael, you, nobody can do what you did, you know, the first paintings you ever made in your life. And I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't really buy into it, but I made a painting, and I went to his critique, and I was shocked at how the people responded. And again, I was not really impressed with my own abilities at that time. And Next month, I brought two paintings, and some of you may know Picasso's Women of Avion, not an easy painting to repaint, and, and Matisse's Blue Nude. I went and made those two paintings, and I showed it to the group, and the group suddenly said, God, you are the most audacious person we've ever seen. You've never taken an art class. You don't even know how to open up a can of paint. And you are already repainting Picasso's, one of his most difficult, most famous paintings, and the same with Matisse. And one little old lady came up and said, he's so audacious, the next thing he'll do is Guernica. <laughs> I don't know if you know what Guernica is, but it's no. Picasso's signature painting. It's 26 feet long. It's become the world's greatest piece painting. And to be honest, I didn't know what it was. So I went home, I found an art book, and I saw the black and white and gray Guernica, and I said, Wait a second, Picasso didn't make it in color? And I, at that time I said, God, this is my chance to make an innovation. And at the time, I, you know, I, I, as you know, I've written books, and I know what it means to have a limited vocabulary, a little, limited skill in writing a book. It gets pretty hard with you know, the less you have to work with. And the same thing with Picasso, he only used shades of gray. And he made this amazing painting. So I set out to repaint it in Technicolor in four months. And I made this seven-foot painting, and I brought it to the art critique, and the people collapsed. <laughs> and lo and behold, a few months later, I, I find out, I get a phone call, and I realize, I'm informed, it's the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Guernica. And the Basque people want, had heard I had a Guernica, they wanted to see it, <laughs> and they made arrangements with me to take my painting as the only painting to be at a 60-day commemorative event of the bombing of Guernica. And then the people who had invited me were going to go to Bilbao, Spain, 
to put on there, same program, and it was, I can't think of the name of the famous museum. They have a, the Guggenheim, in, <laughs> in Bilbao, and they, they were ready to take the painting and hang it in the Guggenheim. And I was getting ready for another knee operation, and I just said, I can't be bothered. And, okay, and you know, overnight, yes, NASA has come to me and asked me to make sustainability, and they're opening up this building called Sustainability Base. Yes, we're going to talk about that later. And so I have said enough, but thank you for uh, listening. Thank you. Can you pass this thing forward? No, it's great. Thank you. That was a great story. It's fabulous. I, I, I'm curious, Howard, how did you come to play music? Did you play as a child or how, with your physics? How did the, in what order and how did it come? So, um, like Michael, I kind of got duped into it. And um, my parents bought a piano. I was about 10 years old. And they both said they were going to take piano lessons. And I wanted to go to the park and play basketball. And I said, fine, I'm going to take piano lessons. And I came back from the park with my basketball, with my friend, and there was this piano in the living room. My friend sat down and he played chopsticks. Mm -hmm. I said, how do you do that? <laughs> and he, he showed me and I played it. And about a half an hour later, when I learned how to play everything else that he could show me, I said to my parents, do you think it would be okay if I took piano lessons also, along with the two of you? And I just imagined them like, you know, winking at each other. They said, well, it might be okay. So the piano teacher came, and they each took a lesson, and then I took a lesson, and then the next week, my father didn't take a lesson, and my mother did, and then the third week, neither one of them took a lesson, and I took a lesson. And by the sixth week, the teacher quit, because every time I got to a repeat sign, and I came back to play that part again, I played it differently. And the teacher said, you're not playing it right. I said, well, I already played it right. Now it's my turn. He said, you're 10 years old. You don't get a turn. He said, well, this is Mozart. This is Clemente. What do you mean it's your turn? I said, well, I already did what you told me to do the first time. Then I got to the pizza. And I don't want to repeat myself. That's a waste of time. So I figured I'd take a shot at it. So the teacher quit. And he wrote my mother a letter saying, I can't have existential conversations with him about why his notes are not and harmonically equivalent to the notes. That, because I said, look, here's what the score says. I played it. I said, here's what I want to do. Could you tell me why these notes are not as good as this? Like, what's the point? So the teacher quit. So that's how I got started. <laughs> that's a good story. All right, that's great. All right. Well, um, and I still I'm, can't read music. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about how I started to dance. So I started to dance when I was six years old, and um, I immediately fell in love with ballet. So after 11 years of bliss and drudgery, I finally reached professional level and uh, won a gold medal from the French Conservatory. Um, I had offered to join uh, many companies, but um, I had the blessing and the curse to be good at math. And um, with the French system, I had to go to engineering school. So the rest is history. I became an engineer and I got a couple of masters in science and uh, worked in tech for the past 20 years. And um, I'm starting now to reconcile my passions. Thank you. So let's get into the meat of the discussion. Because I have, what, three billion copies? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to throw some words and some ideas and uh, bounce them to the, to the panel and to the audience. So, I would like to start with the notion of inspiration and perspiration. So, the Greek philosophers were thinking that inspiration was coming from the muses, and it was only bestowed to the special few. Um, at the other extreme, one of my favorite painters, Chuck Close, has uh, said a quote which I love. He says, inspiration is for amateur. The rest of us just show up and get to work. So I would like to hear from the panel what they are thinking about uh, that notion of inspiration and perspiration. And I will start with Indra. <laughs> okay. um, 
So uh, Sylvie knows how I feel about this, and I'm definitely more a Chumclosian uh, than a Musean. Um, and you know, I think part of that comes from my in, when I as I'm doing neuroscience, my um, interests are memory and creativity, and where the two intersect. And um, the more I study creativity, the more I realize it's like memory in the sense that it's made up a lot of different processes. It's not a single entity. And in order to study it, you need to break it down and understand the different pieces that you're studying. Um, and that the more you talk about people who are uh, highly creative and highly productive, the more they talk about all the work that happened before the spark, um, before the moment of innovation. And that, to me, is really interesting and much more... Um, I guess it's, it's where I find the most inspiration because that's what you can control. You can't control when the inspiration hits, but you can prepare yourself for it. Yeah. And you can do something about the perspiration part. And eventually, inspiration will hit. And it'll hit even if you're not prepared for it and you might miss it. Mm -hmm. And so my job always as, a, as an artist is to work as hard as I possibly can so that when that moment comes, I don't miss it. I really love the way you put it on the phone, you said, I think inspiration comes from perspiration. <laughs> so that's, that's the point I like that. I'm trying to make. So, you know, it comes from uh, all the work that you put in, and, you know, that's what I believe. Um, Michael, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Uh, I found your comment about preparation to be key. And although I never prepared to be an artist my entire life, in a way. I've been preparing for it. And um, I'm inspired, my muse is issues, complex issues that I do not understand and that I want to understand and that I think would be valuable for the public to experience. Now, uh, I'm right now uh, a little uh, beside myself because recently I've been challenged to make a huge and important painting to take advantage of the fact that about a half a billion people are going to be focused on the bay in the summer of 2013, the America's Cup. And you know, I'm very much involved with a many environmental firms, uh, environmental organizations, such as the Save the Bay Foundation. And I've been challenged to make a huge and important painting, probably the biggest in the world, on water, saving the bay, and sustainability. And I'm trying to, in my head, so I'm, I'm a little inspired, but the spark hasn't hit me yet. And I'm now trying to study those issues and put them into perspective. And then as soon as I do, I will have the spark and the inspiration, and I will work like mad to make that painting. Thank you, Michael. Um, Hoyt, I would like to ask you a different question, unless you really want to answer this one. Well, just to, be a, just to have a contrary voice, Please. I'm totally about inspiration, which is probably why I never got great at anything, because I could do anything in the world at a grade B level pretty much instantaneously, and then never get to the grade A level, but that's what's so easy, so I'm an inspiration guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, now let's talk about the right brain. Um, there is this fabulous book I read called uh, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, a course in enhancing your creativity and artistic confidence. Who has read this book? Wonderful. <coughs> um, so in this book, Betty Edwards. Um, explains how she's teaching her students to paint and uh, really she's helping students learn to paint by giving them challenges that their left brain cannot solve. So uh, to give you a little example, um, I mean I, I'm really not a painter, I read this book more to kind of like understand it because I was very curious and uh, she if you want to copy something, you know, unless you're Michael Keelan and, and you can draw do a Picasso the first time, it's not going to look very good. And uh, so she's kind of like doing some tricks. For example, she's having her students put uh, a painting upside down so you don't recognize the symbols. 
and so you're really drawing what you see. And uh, so basically she's saying that learn, we can't draw because we cannot see. So we need to learn to see with our right brain, really see uh, what's happening so we can uh, draw them. So I'm taking this, this, uh, this example and I wanted to ask um, uh, the panel and also the public if you have read this book or if you have an opinion on, on the topic. Um, do you think that learning to draw can help your scientific or technology or business abilities in your job? Who wants to take that question? Howard, I had your name on it. So uh, even though I'm not an artist, I was the chairman of an art department for a while. Somehow, that's a different story. So I'm pretty convinced that learning to draw is about learning how to see. And that people who can't see can't draw that well unless you're kind of got this kind of natural genius thing. But I think learning how to see would help everything that you did in your life. In business, science, everything. And uh, so that's my simple Learn It's about learning how to see. I think Paul Klee said, art teaches us to sing. So thank you, Howard. I would like to ask someone from the audience. Anyone would like to? Michael? Yeah. You want to toss me a microphone or something or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been drawing since I was a little kid. I've always been into it. Um, and I've always been really intrigued, especially as I got into college and got a little bit more, you know, intellectual, I guess you could say, um, that it was a way for me to express myself and explore ideas in ways that I found the, just the languages I knew, English and German, which I don't really use, but I found them not being able to express certain things. You kind of get locked into that particular syntax, and I think that drawing is a really good way to break out of that completely and think in a visual language, so it's just a new way to approach things in new ways to gain perspective by drawing it, especially if you got someone looking over your shoulder and working with you and drawing things. That's always been a really enjoyable way to explore ideas for me. I don't quite Thank remember you. what the initial yeah. question was. But um, I want to add. Someone at your table wants to add something. Richard, I'll oh, get you too. Yeah, so my experience, um, I'm not an artist, but um, I'm trying very hard to be uh, especially when you're trying to teach mathematics and science to people, um, it's really hard to convey mathematics without having a visual representation as well. So the combination of the two is incredibly useful in uh, making the connections. You know, whether you're trying to explain like different parts of a function and how these parts are represented visually and then putting them together, it's an incredible, like, it's awesome to see people really grab the, the uh, the aspects of mathematics from a visual representation, and they're able to like go off and do great things from there. So very interesting. My mother is a mathematician, and uh, I've always been very impressed that uh, she always says she doesn't really like the arts, but whenever we we go and see paintings or anything artistic, she really has a visual sense, and and I'm always surprised. And you know, she's I guess mathematics is art. Um, I wanted to get the. Um, Opinion, I will ask you later. I want to get the opinion of a neuroscientist because we're lucky to have one in the room. Um, I know that you're working on creativity uh, in neuroscience, and so I would be curious to, to hear your viewpoint on how drawing or learning to dance or learning to sing uh, are helping uh, from a neuroscience standpoint. Sure. Well, I mean, I think the brain, as we understand it now, is really about connections between different brain regions. And, um, you know, it's, we no longer think of it as, as compartmentalized as much as we used to in the past. Yeah. Um, because we know that the whole brain is active all the time. Yeah. And um, so when you can tap into something that um, changes the way those circuits would react to each other, I think you're giving yourself the building blocks to think innovatively. Um, and I was just actually listening to NPR the other day, yesterday, I think, and they were talking about students who, um, who are in French immersion in Louisiana, for example. And these kids that start studying French from an early age score two percentage points higher throughout the rest of their uh, careers in all standardized tests. In a, in a, and so, you know, 
that that's just sort of some data that suggests that there is a benefit even from something as simple as learning another language. So of course, learning to play the piano or learning to paint, um, anything that stretches your brain is going to lay down new connections and make your brain fire in a different way. Um, and it's, we know it's now protective from diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about exercising our brain and keeping it in shape. And I think those kinds of analogies are really appropriate because um, you can get stuck thinking in the same way and without a lot of stimulation, there isn't a lot of room for your brain to grow and be plastic. And we know that the way that your brain functions optimally is by being plastic. Wonderful. Could I do business? You Real can quickly. do business if it's short. Thank you. Yeah, drawing, or at least developing your ability to see things, images, is very valuable, I think, because what is business really about? It's about moving different resources to seize different opportunities. And if you can see your resources and you can see your opportunities out there and how you apply those resources, it's extremely helpful. So I encourage business people to draw and do other things to develop, develop that quality. Yes. I think dancing is... Um is similar. I think it's actually a very visual, spatial exercise, and it's really helping develop those uh, same skills. I think uh, John wanted to say something at this table. Thanks. <clears throat> well, uh, sort of a cognitive scientist and a social scientist wrapped up in an artist. <clears throat> it's a confusing place to be sometimes. I think that the, the, the thing that I look at now in my work is I see that there's a, certain, there's a certain level of ego involved in the idea that we are creative. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. But I do mean that I, I, I believe we're coming upon a time when humanity is beginning to recognize that it may well have the capacity to express creation. But whether actually creation is ours or whether creation is something that comes through us is something that we ought to look at. And I think that most of the great creative people I've met in my life, and I've been very, very fortunate in my travels, to meditate, many of them. That there's a certain humility and humbleness that I find in those people, which is when they realize that they trained their brain, they did the sweat, they put in the hours, they got everything right to prepare for something that actually was not theirs. And I'm, I'm, I'm working a lot these days in <clears throat> looking at how corporate cultures form, um, mainly because I think that the idea that people own ideas, that they have ideas, is a part of the problem, the failure in our system. The idea that ideas are there and emergent and that people can be prepared to see them and to use them in innovation in certain ways, I think is a far more powerful concept because I think it gives us all access. So I, I, I do art because as an Englishman, I grew up in a school where <clears throat> being creative back then, and forgive my, my totally politically incorrect terminology here, but back then being creative was akin to being a faggot. And that wasn't acceptable. You didn't do that. But I love to draw and I love to play the guitar and I love to sing and dance and do all kinds of crazy things. And I found that by actually now and later in my life, breaking back down those barriers is not so much that I have changed something in me, but I've opened something mm -hmm. in me. I've actually opened back up that particular, hate to worth use channel, it's always misunderstood, but that particular navigational pathway, if you will, for something bigger than me to actually be expressed. So anyway, sorry for taking so long. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. So, um, Just a quick please. You know, I've had the experience of working with groups in conflict a fair amount. And one of the things that's really interesting to me along the drawing is that you can capture sometimes in a very small diagram of some sort the point of view of one side, shall we say. And then you can put on the same, it's important to put it on the same piece of paper. You capture the essence of the other side. And putting it on the same piece of paper seems to drive connection in both brains, and people kind of go, oh, is that what you meant? And for the first time, they begin to hear each other. Wonderful, thank you. So, I would like to move to a different world. I would like to talk about problems. I would like to talk about solving problems versus finding problems. So, um, another great book called Little Bats, How Breakthrough Discoveries Come from Small Ideas by Peter Sims as a whole chapter saying questions are the new answers. And um, so I would like uh, um, the panel, I will start with the whole this time, uh, to comment on, on, on innovation. Do you think being innovative is about solving a problem or finding and defining a problem? Um, 
I think that we're all capable of breakthroughs on demand, and it's mostly that we don't think it's possible that prevents us from doing it. So whether you have, and when you are capable of breakthroughs on demand, you don't actually have to look for problems. Just walking around in life, you see a thousand of them around you. So I don't think innovators actually look for problems to solve. I think people want to make money look for problems to solve. I think creative, artistic, innovative people just live and breathe and they see things and they go, oh, it's curiosity that drives it, not thinking that it's something that happens. Okay, so I, I guess the, the question, I, I'm saying the same thing. I think there is a notion of uh, being creative is, you know, cracking this big equation and, and, and solving a problem. But a lot of the creative pro people are actually uh, defining new problems, finding problems that they find important and interesting uh, to tackle. So it's not really about solving problems. Like if I go back to, uh, to uh, Chuck Lowe's, you know, he was saying that um, solving problems, you know, is, um, I can't remember if it's boring, but it's really a problem creation that is interesting. All those painters um, have really, by kind of changing the rules, and you know, that's kind of like what you do in innovation, they find, you know, new types of problems. All people were kind of like, always doing the same thing, and they are, you know, changing the parameters and the issues to kind of defining new problems. So innovation, there's incremental innovation and there's disruptive innovation. And the disruptive innovation, that tends to come from the people who are not trying to necessarily solve problems. They're exactly. just like out there in the world doing their thing. Incremental innovation comes from people who are trying to figure out how to adjust something more, I think. Exactly, yeah. And so, um, so in terms of uh, if we're going back to um, artists, I know we have a lot of artists in the room and I have one friend who is an artist whom I'm going to paint. Her name is Danielle. Um, do you think that uh, you're looking... Um, uh, are you trying to solve existing problem or you're looking to define new problems? I, I think both. I think... Um, I am Danielle. Um, I think that when you look at uh, artists and how they approach sort of problem solving, it really is either they find something that they feel a really big necessity to tackle and they play with and experiment with that, or as they're playing with something, new problems come up. I know that one of the reasons that I became an artist is because I was really tired of trying to um, fit within a business model, a bureaucratic model to get work done to solve community issues, to solve issues like climate change and global warming, and to go with the means that you have to go through uh, when you are on somebody on uh, a, a lower level or have to adhere to uh, a bureaucratic timeline, it's as an artist, you actually get to be the scientist, you get to be the engineer, you get to be the social worker, you get to be the innovator to solve those problems because you're not restricted from the things that pro prohibit innovation. So as an artist, you can observe these problems like, for example, you know, how do you visualize uh, your smart meter? I mean, is it, is it looking at a business model making your home as a house or is it really looking at it as how do you um, look at the emotional connection that uh, that an occupant or a visitor can have with a building. Those sort of like ab abilities to see that problem are very different than if you were working in sort of a more of a rigid uh, structure, I guess you could say. So I think it's a little bit of both, either yeah. discover it or... Yeah. Thank you very much. And actually it's a very smooth transition to a question I wanted to ask Michael. Because Michael is using his art to drive awareness for climate change. So I would be very curious to understand, do you feel, Michael, that the microphone is here, do you feel that uh, you can have more impact through art than with words? Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, this time in my life, it's, uh, yeah, I know I'm verbal, uh, but if we take a look, remember what... Uh, his name, that great philosopher. I'll get, I'll get, I'll remember him. He said there's only three ways to persuade, influence people. And one way is to be seen with important people or organizations. 
So I'm always seen with NASA, with the county of Santa Clara, or other important folks. And then the other way is to appeal to their logic. And that has been the primary way many, many organizations, people are trying to persuade people around the world today to, to change their behavior with respect to some very important topics like the, the woman over there mentioned climate change. But there's many, many, many of these very important issues where the, where the science appealing to people's logic is not working, okay? So a third way is to appeal to people's emotions. And art has a great capability to appeal to people's emotions. So I see a void in this world, although I know a lot of artists have done work on climate change, population explosion, etc., the end of species and all of that. But it's just an incredible void not enough people are applying art to help persuade, inform, and change behavior. Wonderful, thank you. Um, 